Dr. Natalie Marks, and we're here with another quick cup of knowledge. Joining me today is Dr. Terry Ryan Kane. She is owner of A2B Vet. We're very excited to have you here today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. You had standing room only for three hours here lecturing about the role of the veterinarian with honeybees. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a really interesting story. Tell us how you got interested in bees. Well, I've always liked insects from the time I was a little girl. And I went to graduate school and became in ecology. And beetles were my animal model, but I was interested in honeybees primarily because of their navigation and communication skills. And I had read Carl Van Frisch's book, he won the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Animal Behavior, first time, for uh, the waggle dance, for determining how the bees communicate in the dark on a vertical surface. They're able to tell their sisters where to go to find food, the value of the food resource, how far away it is, and then find their way back three miles away. It's incredible. So they've had GPS for th millions of years, and we just had it since 1994. And I'm a pilot, and I was just fascinated with how they could navigate when I would get lost and have to circle water towers to find out where I was. It's, it, they're remarkable animals, just remarkable. So you've had this lifelong interest, mm -hmm. and, but you're also a veterinarian. Yes. And so, so the pairing of that has, um, we're sort of late to the game, aren't we? A, a little bit. So yeah. tell us about how that marriage sort of happened. Well, I've been a beekeeper for fun, off and on. I had to stop for a while because I have a bunch of kids and <laughs> practice life and such. And after I sold my practice, I uh, was fortunate to receive an AVMA Congressional Fellowship. And I worked in Congress, and we worked on the Farm Bill Food Safety Modernization Act. So I knew the crisis of global health epidemic of antimicrobial resistance. And we knew that if we didn't get voluntary compliance to reduce medically important antibiotics in our food animal supply, that regulations would come, and they did. And I think that the poultry, swine, dairy producers expected this, but the honey professionals didn't, honeybee people didn't, they got gobsmacked by this. They didn't mm -hmm. know that they would be under the oversight of veterinarians. And boy, is it a good thing. Because without bees, without pollinators, we wouldn't have food other than corn and soybeans. So I think the thing is, people don't appreciate that the variety of food we have, including chocolate, coffee, the things we really love, and then the things we need, all these vitamins and minerals, the diversity of food that we eat, requires animal pollination. So it's not just honeybees, but it's butterflies and ants and beetles and all the other pollinators that need protection. And it just so happened when these regulations came, being a beekeeper, knowing the food safety, food security, what we call one health issues, I mm -hmm. uh, put that together and I feel like my job right now is to educate other veterinarians, especially the younger generation, because they know about antimicrobial resistance. They know global climate change is real. They, they know this stuff, and so you just have to present the data to them, and they take it and run. And where do you see the veterinarian role in this? Do you, do you see this? Uh, well, well why we're, don't you tell we're me? public health officials. Right. So food safety and food security is our job. And if we want to eat, and the other thing I was telling people today is, what do you think all of our food animals eat? Right. Animal pollinated food. So if you want eggs and cheese and milk and meat that the animals eat, we need to take care of the pollinators. Exactly. It's, it's an entire food chain. And definitely in the One Health perspective. Yes. Definitely a One Health issue. Yeah. So those two things I talked about today were the, by 2050, the, they predict there's going to be 10, million, 10 billion people on the planet. Mm. That's like adding the city of Los Angeles every month. 2050 is not that far away. No. And with water resources being scarce in places, they're predicting that agriculture is going to have to produce 30 to 70 percent more to feed all these people. Well, how do you think we're going to do that mm -hmm. if we're killing all our insects? And veterinarians 
have a crucial role. It's never been more important for veterinarians to get involved in this. Never. This is critical that we do this. It's our job. It is. Yeah. And, but not every veterinarian was able to listen to three hours of all of this incredible information today. So for, for people watching that want to become more involved, what are some resources or first steps that they could take? If, well, the first thing is to don't mow your dandelions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the simple things. Provide habitat for your native bees. Let brush piles. Leave old wood in your yard. Put up a bee hotel. You can buy bee hotels everywhere now. You can make a bee hotel. So just provide habitat for your native pollinators. And then if you're really interested and you want to do something as a veterinarian for bees, go to bee school. Have a couple hives. You don't need to own a pig to be a swine vet, but you need to be comfortable around the species. You need, and that's why we did bee lab yesterday, mm -hmm. is just to get people familiar with what it's like to be around bees. What's involved? What do you have to wear? What are the tools? you Like we do with every other animal. How do you handle them? So the million dollar question I think a lot of people are wanting to know is, do you ever get stung? Of course. <laughs> Is that just one of the hazards of the job, right? If you're a horse vet, do you ever get kicked? <laughs> if you're a cat vet, do you ever get scratched? Duh, of yeah. course. But luckily, I'm not allergic. And this is one area that's a little different from other animals. Well, people are allergic to cats. And if people are allergic, this is probably not the field that they should go into. Um, I do advise people to carry EpiPens with them if they have any chance of being allergic and if I take a technician or we do a bee lab we always have things around in case something happens because al allergic reactions are no joke. No. Yeah. But you mentioned technician and most of our talk has been about the veterinarian's role but Oh well, we I, need technicians everywhere, are you kidding? Yeah exactly so what what are the opportunities for veterinary technicians that are watching this? Well just, just like any farm call you know help find the farm, carry my stuff, help me suit up and do the work and do the diagnostic testing and hold the test tubes and everything a technician does anywhere else, yeah. And if they're interested, and I had some come today, they said, what can I do? Go to B-School, same thing. And what, what do you learn about in B-School? You learn, it's B-Lab personified. So, um, Cornell has an online bee school for veterinarians, so there's a lot of extension services. Some of the botanical gardens have bee school uh, one day a month for a year to take a class through the whole year of beekeeping. Um, bee clubs are, every city has a bee club. Um, I have a veterinarian uh, who I met in Chicago who's starting a side practice treating the rooftop hives in all the restaurants. I mean, every city has rooftop hives now. I mean, bees are everywhere. Uh, New York Times published a big thing a couple months ago where there was a swarm in, in Times Square. They had to call a beekeeper policeman oh. to come catch the swarm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And the other thing is people blame bees for things that are really yellow jackets. Bees don't really sting unless you bother them. These Africanized bees don't really sting unless you bother them. They, if you walk into their territory, but... Um, I get stung because I open the hive and I inspect the frames and I'm messing with them and so I get stung. But I anticipate just like learning dog and cat behavior, bees have behaviors, right? They do. And you need to learn about that before you approach and work. Yeah. And Same as with any other animal, it's just a new species. Yeah, exactly. We've been through it before. We have fish <laughs> vets now. Who knew we'd have fish vets 20 years ago? Right. Yeah. Well, this is incredibly exciting. Um, I, it I, is. I know it's your passion. We, you know, you're you're completely in in love with bees, and you've shown me your jewelry and everything. And I and I love that that's something that it evokes passion because that's really what um, we're trying to do is is find ways that veterinarians and veterinary technicians um, can follow their passion, follow their heart, and be good to themselves in the profession and also personally. And it sounds like that's what bees are doing for I you. I feel like this is the most important work I've done in my profession. That's really awesome. Yeah, feels good. I thought I was retired. <laughs> well, we all want to feel good. Yeah. Thank, thank you for inspiring. Thank you. thank you for letting everyone know about some resources, and I'm sure a lot of people watching are going to want to follow in your footsteps. So thanks for all you're doing for the industry, and uh, good luck at the rest of the conference. Thank you.